since then has hosted a citizens assembly on climate change. And because of the recommendations that came through from the assembly and the responses by the council to those recommendations, we are now here today hosting a youth climate summit. There was a strong sense from a representation of viewpoints and backgrounds in the climate change citizens assembly that took place last year, that we ought to be speaking to people who necessarily aren't engaged with the issue to the greatest extent, or may contribute the least to climate problems that we all face, and yet will face disproportionately the largest impacts in future years. And predominantly, those people are young people. And so the City Council is very proud to be hosting this youth summit today and to be having it facilitated by some of Oxford's most involved and engaged climate activists and young people. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because if you look at the age of the Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, today, it's 56. A 16 year old today to reach the Prime Minister's age won't do that for another 40 years. It will be 2060. So that begs the question, what will the planet look like in 2060? What will Oxford look like in 2060? When a young person who's age 16 today reaches the age of the current Prime Minister, what world will they live in? And that begs the question, how can young people be brought into the conversations and the decisions which will try to stave off the worst effects of climate breakdown and therefore mean that they're able to enjoy longer, happier and safer lives? And this is very much what the summit is here for today. We have two futures. We have one where in this decade, we take the action that's necessary to control emissions and to create a brighter and better world. Or we have one where politicians continue at a national level to fail young people and not control emissions and as a consequence see our cities become hotter and our world become harder to live within. The City Council chooses the better vision but in order to make that a practical reality we need to hear from young people today about what that vision ought to look like, how we should bring that about and we need to support young people to campaign and lobby for change on an even greater scale than before and so today we've got some really interesting and exciting sessions. We've got a session with Annalisa Dodds the MP for Oxford East, where she'll be explaining about how young people can lobby effectively and to help create the change that we need to see today. We have a session involving uh, a conversation about transportation led by one of the report writers for the major UN report, which predicted the need to address climate breakdown. And we've got a session later on, which is facilitated by Oxfam GB. Oxfam obviously having born, been born in Oxford, doing Oxford proud as a distributor of international aid which brings together young people from, the from around the world, particularly those parts of the world where climate impacts are being felt now and where the impacts of climate breakdown are causing a deepening of poverty and inequality. And my hope is that that brings young people in Oxford together with young people from the global south so that together there can be some sort of conversation about how we address not just climate breakdown, but the poverty and inequality that it fuels. And we'll also have a great session, which you'll be able to vote on, the you'll be able to vote on the specifics of um, and that conversation will be led by our new chief scientist who also contributed to that groundbreaking UN report, um, Professor Nick Eyre. So I'm going to hand over now to the young people who have very generously offered their time and their expertise and their years of experience in developing Oxford's response to climate breakdown at their level. Um, and they're going to talk through what the rest of the summit looks like. So if I can hand over now, have a great time for the rest of the summit. I hope to hear some amazing things from all of you, um, and I'm very much looking forward to finding out more. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you for introducing the summit. So, hi everyone. My name is EJ Fawcett. I'm an 18-year-old youth climate activist from Oxfordshire. This event is really important to me because it shows that local politicians are listening to young people and want to empower us to be able to make a difference in local politics. Lynette? Hi, I'm Lynette Drew. I'm a sixth form student from Oxford. And um, last year I opened up the Oxford Citizens Assembly on Climate Change to represent young people. Um, I think this is a really exciting event because Oxford is our city and being able to know how we can influence it at a local level is really important for our future, for where we live and what we represent. Because in order to combat climate change, that's going to have to start with empowerment. So I hope that this sessions and these um, interactions with the questions will allow you to inform council policy and feel empowered to do, act on climate change. Hi there, my name is Dexter. I'm 15 and I'm 
currently preparing to sit my GCSEs. I'm one of the coordinators at Oxford Youth Strike, and I'm really excited to be here today because it'll allow us, the youth, to have a far greater platform and to get our voice out there to a much greater degree than we've been able to in the past. So today, um, as Tom mentioned, we have a vote. And so we've got three sections of the vote, um, buildings, renewable energy and waste. Um, we've got a link to Slido, which is a voting system in the caption that's down below. And um, so if you'd like to, please feel free to choose one of the sections there. Um, each of us facilitators are just going to go through one of the sections and what they entail. So starting off with buildings. More of uh, the most of Oxford, Oxford's carbon emissions come from buildings. Um, no other source in Oxford produces as many uh, carbon emissions, not transport, not food. And people who have bad housing and poor insulation are often the poorest people in the city and will be having to pay more energy bills. It's immensely disproportionately um, affecting of these people. So if you'd like to hear more about that, um, vote for buildings. EJ? Yes, so one of the other choices is renewable energy. So it's obviously a very important topic because many schools in the county don't have solar panels, uh, many are lacking in insulation, as was mentioned in, a, in Dexter's part. Um, fossil fuels are awful and we have an over-reliance on them as a county. And what is Oxford City Council doing to reduce the city's reliance on gas and other fossil fuels? Because as long as we get our energy from unsustainable sources, it doesn't matter how much insulation we put in, it doesn't matter how efficient we become. So but for renewable energy, if you want to hear more about it, Lynette. Hi, thanks. The final choice is um, waste. Waste is an issue that um, covers all aspects of our city and especially um, urban areas such as Oxford, but it's an issue that we don't often like to talk about. It's quite uncomfortable and we don't often see it because it's taken away from us. But this, this is quite a underrated problem um, to do with climate change. And if you want to know more about why that's a problem, but also how that might actually be a key to a solution, then vote for the buildings option, the um, waste option to get a taste of this issue at a local level and what you can do to support change in waste. So click on the um, Slido link and vote for your preferred choice. And then at the end, Nick Air will do an impromptu talk with us about that issue and answer some of your questions. Amazing. Thanks, you two. So our first speaker today is Mrs. Annalise Dodds. She is the um, Labour MP for Oxford East and the current Shadow Councillor of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So, Mrs. Dodds, would you like to take it away? Thank you very much indeed, Dexter. I'm afraid I'm not married. Sorry about that. So I'm just a miss. But look, it's really, really good to be with you all this morning. And just first of all, for me, I want to say a big thank you, because I think the actions of the youth climate strikers and indeed people right across the environmental movement, both the traditional NGOs, but Extinction Rebellion, um, Greenpeace, other groups that have been working on this are really starting to cut through now. Um, I mean, you know about the uh, developments that we've seen over recent months, the fact that um, Parliament did announce that we are experiencing a climate emergency last year. Um, that recognition should have come earlier, but it's good that at least we now have that uh, formally as a position that's been taken by the, the political system in the UK. Um, so I'm really proud of the fact that we've got there. But of course, we've now, now that we've said there's an emergency, what do you do when there's an emergency? You act to deal with that emergency, uh, uh, to take that concrete action. Um, I think we've seen a number of positive developments there, but they've not gone far enough. Um, I am worried that I suppose as we've experienced this period, and I'm sure that you've all been talking about this while we're in the middle of this particular crisis because of coronavirus, that actually people could say, well, now we've just got to focus on economic growth after this because we're seeing a lot of unemployment 
but actually it will be, in my view, um, through that just transition towards a more environmentally friendly future that we can build many of the new jobs that we will need for people who've become unemployed through this period. We've calculated about 400,000 new jobs could be created just over the next 18 months focusing on environmental uh, missions, you know, whether it's about nature management, retrofitting of energy inefficient homes, um, whether it's about building that new energy infrastructure that was just mentioned that's going to be so critical. You know, there's a lot of really good quality um, work that needs to be created and which will help us in that transition and we need to be getting on with it immediately. Um, I would say also, uh, although for very sad reasons, we're now in a position where there's a recognition the emergency is affecting our country right now. Um, you know, there, there may have previously been an acknowledgement that was occurring in other countries, but of course, very, very sadly, a few months ago, we saw for the first time, uh, actually transport engineers coming off the fence and saying, yes, uh, there was a critical piece of infrastructure which was damaged because of climate change. People remember that railway line that got uh, badly damaged in, in the northeast of Scotland. They, they actually said this is because of uh, the climate crisis um, and we will see more of this unless we take action. So now's the time, I would say, to keep up the pressure. I've been asked to talk particularly about um, how to do that in practical terms. I mean, I think a lot of people on this call have been doing that. And certainly I've had a lot of contact from uh, youth climate strikers uh, in Oxford. Um, and I would just say, you know, please keep that going. Um, also across Oxfordshire as well. Um, I think it's really important that we make sure that this is every member of parliament's business. Um, so make sure, please, that you're pushing that message uh, right across Oxfordshire. Um, very, very important. Where it's possible to actually do it face to face, I think that can help as well. You know, booking in surgery appointments, that kind of thing. Um, uh, really trying to push the point. And it's about having some of those hard conversations as well. Um, I mean, I don't know if people saw, in fact, you've probably got much better things to do, but um, the government just released its infrastructure strategy um, and it's called Faster, it's something like Faster, Better, Greener. And it's got a picture of motorways on the front of it. Um, and huge amounts of it is actually consumed with environmentally damaging um, technologies rather than those that we need to uh, shift towards the future we all need to see. So I think it's about having some of those difficult conversations, being very open about them and saying, yes, this is going to involve change, but you know, we're on your side in, in arguing for that change. Um, I would just say as well, I think locally, you know, there's a lot of really good work going on. I can see that Tom Hayes is here from the City Council. Um, I think there's, there's a lot that we can do together. We've got now some parts of the city which are going to become low traffic neighbourhoods. I think where it's possible to, to back up those who are arguing for change, um, to show that this is something that you know young people want as well. I think that really, really helps because there, there will be people who will be affected by this. There will be people whose lives will be impacted when they can't you know, use their car in the same way. So I think it's, it's dealing with those problems and saying, look, together, we've got to do this and we'll back you up and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll work together to protect communities as we go through this process. Um, but yeah, just a, a massive thanks to me, really, for, for all that you're doing. Um, uh, and uh, I guess just the, the very final thing I would say is um, that I've often felt talking to climate strikers and sometimes, you know, I've had this, there, there was a, a course that went on at the, um, uh, the Natural History Museum last year. Uh, involving young people uh, around practical action related to climate change. And, you know, one of the other speakers was saying, oh, you know, keep it up, you young people. You need to keep it up. This is your fight. Well, actually, it's good that you, it is your fight, but it's got to be everybody else's fight. This isn't just for young people. That's too heavy a burden. You know, it's my generation actually, and Tom's, Tom's a bit younger than me, but those older than us as well, who've got to achieve that change. Um, so it's, it's got to be done right across everybody. Um, that burden is not just yours, but it's, it's great what you're doing and just a big, big thank you from me. Thanks. Um, would, what would you say the most effective thing that young people can do to fight the climate crisis would be? Um, yeah, just a couple of specific things. Sure. I mean, it, it would be interesting to hear thoughts from all of you about this as well, Dexter. I would, I would say, actually, um, if you've got representatives at, at any level, you know, whether that's um, uh, with the district councils, county council or um, uh, your, your member of parliament who aren't persuaded of the need for change, 
then I think actually asking to speak to them directly, I genuinely think that can make a big difference. Book, booking in a surgery appointment, you know, councillors uh, do that as well as um, uh, members of parliament and just talking them through it and just, just explaining it to them. Um, I think that can make a big difference because I think this is an area where, you know, a lot of people don't understand you know, all of the kind of technicalities of it, it can be really helpful um, to have a, a constituent just kind of discuss it, really. And then I would say also it's about, um, I think, really getting together with those who are pushing for change and showing that there's a, a strong coalition of support for that change. Um, because, you know, some of what's happening locally and actually nationally as well, as I said, there are voices who, who don't want that change. Um, you know, and, and there is going to be disruption, but I think actually showing like, this is something that's positive. You know, if we're talking about um, living streets, this is something that will be positive. It'll actually be really positive for local businesses in those areas, because when people aren't frightened about being hit by a car, et cetera, they tend to use, you know, those areas more, et cetera. It, it's showing that there's that, that broad support for it. Um, and I think where, where we can work together and have that positive approach, yes, let's, let's criticise what's going wrong, but let's also work together to say, yeah, we want this, we can achieve this change, we can do it together, and all of us are calling for that, you know, not just a few people. I guess they would be the two things that I would, I would focus on, really. Great, thanks. Um, so we've just got a couple of questions in from our viewers. The first one is um, how... Can we campaign politically during COVID restrictions? So obviously that has made it harder. And you know, I would say to all the young people on this call, just just solidarity, really, because I know it's it's really difficult at the moment. And I think you know, you're doing a brilliant job. I mean, I've been really impressed by what's going on in all the schools and colleges in Oxford and indeed at the university. I think people are, you know, working really hard to, to stay safe, keep older people safe. Um, but that does obviously have a knock-on impact on your ability to, to be together and the kind of enormous rallies that we've seen uh, before around the youth climate strike. Obviously, they're not possible now. It'd be a very bad idea to do that in, in current circumstances. I mean, I think this, this kind of event can really help actually bring people together um, continuing that coordination. Um, but when it comes to kind of lobbying representatives, um, I mean, we, we're kind of still there. I mean, I'm sure I'm looking at Tom here and he's, you know, he's still there as a local council. All the other um, kind of representatives should still be open to hearing representations from you. So I think now is a good time to be kind of redoubling that pressure, I would say, um, making sure that, that you are kind of putting your local representatives on the spot. Um, and they should be operating, you know, I operate kind of a virtual surgery or, or ring people or whatever, that should still be happening. So I would say that's worth doing. And obviously all the, the social media work that you're doing as well. Also, I mean, it's been interesting, the Oxford Mail's covered a lot of, of what you've been doing as well and BBC Oxford. I would say just keep keeping up that link as well as a really good idea. Um, you know, it's good coverage of, of this event uh, in the mail recently. Just keeping that going, I think it's really, really helpful. Engaging with the chat as well, which I know can sometimes feel a bit stressful, but quite often there's, you know, people who might be a bit more sceptical, actually getting involved in that can be a good idea as well to persuade people. Um, so yeah, I think there is quite a lot that can be done, but I appreciate it's difficult circumstances now. Just another question. Um, in what ways is the Labour Party um, needing to up its game um, to combat the climate crisis? So I think we, we all need to up our game, but I would include my party within that. You know, I think there's there's much more that we need to do. And I, I think that's particularly important, I would say, when, when there's there's quite often a lot of, um, I suppose, immediate pressures. I mean, obviously, coronavirus crisis, um, got potential of a no deal Brexit coming, unfortunately, as, as well, or a very thin deal Brexit um, uh, uh, around the end of the year. Um, but of course, we, we can't forget that existential crisis, which is the climate crisis and ecological crisis. Um, so I think it's really important, certainly for my party, to be saying, look, this isn't about kind of choosing between different urgent changes we've got to make. We've got, we've got to face up to all of them. And actually, you know, as I um, mentioned before, I think that uh, at a time when there, there is going to be rising unemployment, 
And there's so much that we can do to deal with that and to build a far better system for the future in terms of more environmentally friendly country, you know, better transport, better managed um, and nature, um, more energy efficient homes and, and, and so forth. Um, so we have got to do both. Um, I think also from the point of view, particularly as a Labour Party, um, I mean, I talk a lot to our trade unions. I think we've got to really redouble that effort. Um, we've got to put a lot more work into questions that haven't always received that much um, publicity and discussion previously. I mean, you know, we have got some very, very energy intensive industries, obviously, in the UK. You know, very often people talk about a just transition, but often people's experience of retraining um, and redeployment has been very, very bad in the UK. You know, you think about what happened to our coal mining areas that just were, were pretty much left without any support to enable people to get decent jobs into the future. So we've got to work, I think, very closely with the trade unions in particular as the Labour Party to make sure those really good quality opportunities will be there for people so that, you know, they, they, they won't view the transition as a threat, which is what it could be if we don't have those really good opportunities there for people to move into and really excellent quality training, the kind of things that, that you know, that I would want to experience myself or, or would want for yourselves or for, or for my kids. That's what's got to be there in those areas that would be heavily impacted. I completely agree with you on that. We need to provide um, alternatives and places that um, people can move into to work in as opposed to these carbon emission heavy jobs. Um, just looking at some more of the questions. Um, here's one. Many MPs refuse to listen to us because we cannot vote. Do you have any further ideas of how we as young people can get through to them? You said that um, we should, of course, um, attempt to um, contact them through um, going and talking to them, like uh, surgery or something like that. Um, but even then, um, they don't have much of an obligation to um, listen to us as young people. I mean, I, I would say they've got a moral obligation actually to listen. And, you know, there are quite a lot of people who live in my constituency, but who can't vote, you know, lots of people who, um, uh, because of their um, uh, the, their national status, for example, they're not able to vote, but, you know, it's still my job to be their representative, whether or not they can vote. So I think I think they have a moral obligation uh, to listen. Um, I would also say, by the way, that I personally think you should be able to vote because I think people who are 60, I'm not I'm not judging anybody's age here, but I do think that people should be able to vote from the age of 16. And it's my view that that will eventually come. I mean, it's just been agreed on in Wales um, that 16, 17 year olds will be able to vote. Um, so I think that change will come. Um, but also, I mean, of course, you're going to be able to vote into the future. And if people haven't listened to you now, um, uh, then I'm sure that you're not going to forget that once you do become uh, of voting age. So um, I'd be optimistic uh, w when it comes to that. Just the last question for you today. Um, does contacting a local MP affect anything on a national level? Um, yes, I really think that it can. Um, actually, a number of the areas that I've ended up working on as a member of parliament have come from people getting in contact with me and letting me know about a particular injustice or, or a particular subject that I just simply wasn't aware of previously or, um, you know, that I, I didn't understand enough about. Uh, so I really do think it can make a very significant difference, definitely. I'm not saying that in every single circumstance it's going to uh, lead directly to change, um, but I, th I think it's always worth uh, trying to engage in that way. And I, I, I would always say that that personal contact really makes a difference. I mean, MPs get a lot of emails, for example. Quite often they'll be the same email, kind of campaign email, where you can draw on your own experience um, and really personalise it or have that face-to-face -face chat, I do genuinely think that can make a big difference. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time today. It's been great to have you. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for all you're doing. It's, it's brilliant to be with you. And, and uh, yeah, keep, keep up the good fight. Let's keep working together. And, and thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Thanks. And Dexter, if I if I may, just to say, I think that was an, ex, an extraordinarily good example of young people 
holding our elected officials accountable and asking really probing questions. Um, so a big thanks to everybody who asked those questions. Um, I just I should have said something at the outset, which is to say this is an event organised by the City Council. It's um, specifically not a party political event. Um, it is very much about the City Council and all of the people represented and elected within it being able to hear from young people so that collectively we can all make decisions together, which will be hopefully for the betterment of our society. Um, so thanks for that session and thank you for all of those questions. Right, so now we're on to International Voices with John McClaverty and I shall be facilitating this session. So John is an education and youth advisor at Oxfam and will be introducing videos from young environmental campaigners in the global south uh, because it's very important that we discuss climate justice not just how we can stop the climate crisis for ourselves. So thank you very much uh, for being on the call today. And um, do you want to take it away? Uh, I'm afraid you're muted. Uh, you I'm afraid I was muted. Yeah, so thank you, EJ, and thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to Oxford City Council for inviting Oxfam along this morning. And thank you to the young people for organizing and facilitating. And thank you to everyone who is um, joining us this morning. Um, Tom Garud, can you get the slides up by any chance? Is that going to be possible? And there is now an awkward Zoom pause as the slides arrive. Here we go. OK, so um, I'll introduce myself. I'm John McLaverty. I'm a youth campaigner with Oxfam GB. Um, I work here in the UK with secondary school and university students, but my uh, focus is global. So what I want to do right now is to move our thoughts and our focus um, further away from Oxford or from the UK shores and think about the meaning of climate justice on a global scale. So despite how climate breakdown is um, sometimes presented in the media. And the next slide is okay, Tom, that would be great, thanks. Um, the climate crisis is basically all about inequality and injustice. So this may change in the future, as Annalise said, impacts are starting to affect us here in the UK. But right now, humankind is not in this crisis together, and that is a really big problem. So in a nutshell, the people who've done the most to cause climate breakdown, and that is us in this country and people in other similar countries, we right now are those who are affected the least by um, climate breakdown's disastrous impacts. And the other side of the coin is the people around the world who have done the very least to cause the crisis are the ones who are literally taking the heat, the droughts, the floods, the storms, and all the other extreme impacts the climate crisis is contributing to. So one way of showing this injustice is on this slide. You can see that the UK's per person carbon emissions in 2018 were 56 times those of a person in Malawi um, or in Uganda. And this actually, this does show some progress because if we'd looked at the figures for maybe um, 10 or 15 years ago, the, the scale difference would have been 100. It is now 56, but it is still an absolutely massive difference. And this snapshot is only for one year. So our carbon emissions in the UK have been building up over two centuries since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And we are a rich country because of the emissions that we and our ancestors have made in the past. Um, Generally speaking, countries like Malawi and Uganda have not yet begun a journey of industrialization and wealth creation that we have been on for 200 years. So really in global terms, um, whatever our lifestyle choices are, and no matter what the wise decisions that Oxford City Council will make um, with your guidance and advice, we in this room on this call, we are all climate privileged. So let's have a look at the next slide, Tom. So um, in Malawi and Uganda and countless other countries of the global south, as you'll hear in a moment, the damage of climate breakdown has already been done. 
So even if every rich country was to cut its emissions to net zero tomorrow, the damage is going to continue to be done for a long time into, into the future. And these are poor countries where most people are poor and climate breakdown is pushing people into even deeper poverty and greater insecurity that we right now in the UK cannot really imagine, I, I, I believe. Right, the next slide, um, please. So we're going to hear from some young people. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from Jesse and Coma and Isaac Mzembe. And they're in their senior year at secondary school um, where they belong to the Climate Club. And they live near the town of Kasungu in central Malawi. So in September 2019, um, they visited the UK and participated in the youth climate strike in London outside Parliament. And then earlier this week, or last Monday, Oxfam and Malawi caught up with Jessie and asked her to record a message for this morning. So just before we watch these two video clips, just take a look around the photograph at the landscape and the dried up river. And this in a farming community um, is what climate breakdown looks like in, in, in Malawi and across much of the global south. Take a look at that. And Tom, if it's possible, will take a look at the two videos, just one after the other. Thank you. This is when Zoom gets scary. Yeah, so while uh, the videos are getting set up, would you maybe want to answer a couple of questions? We can do that, absolutely, if you like, yeah. So why is this an important issue for Oxford specifically? Um, because many people may argue like, oh, you know, the UK as a whole needs to get better. So why should Oxford be the first to make the change? Um, I wouldn't argue that Oxford should be the first to make the change. I know that many municipalities and cities across the UK have declared similar climate emergencies and are doing similar events with young people. Um, I was involved with a school group who worked with Haringey Council in London to declare a climate emergency. In fact, you'll see some of these young people in the video in a moment. So um, I'm not... Um, I'm not holding Oxford to any special responsibility in this respect. I think we, we all have a joint responsibility, but the missing piece in the puzzle is that very often we do not think about the wider global picture. We do not think of the damage that has been done in countries like Malawi and Uganda, as you will see, and that there is an additional action or element that has to be in what we do to redress that injustice and inequality. Yeah. Yeah, you've mentioned you mentioned before how privileged we in the UK are. Here we go with the first video. All of the young people here have come along with their teachers to discuss the impacts of climate change on their lives and to make some placards which they have here with them to take out onto the climate change rally happening in Parliament Square. Jesse and Isaac um, sat here to my right, are here from Malawi. Can you tell us what you've written on your on your sign to take to the to the rally later on? Malawi is destroyed by climate change. Please take action. And you've made a sign as well. My present is being destroyed. Let's take an action now. By contrast to a lot of the placards we may see today about the future, you've said my present is being destroyed. Yeah, I had like this because these negative impacts of climate change are currently occurring in my country. Malawi is really, really affected, so I'm looking forward to see change. We are standing here to tell you more about negative impacts which are happening in Malawi. because the crops they may dry up before the time they are mature and this 
It is leading to hunger and malnutrition to children. High temperature, these are favorable conditions for the breeding of mosquitoes and this it is leading to malaria. Well, that was really okay. powerful. Yeah. And, and you mentioned before about how there's a, there's a, Yeah, there's a second video of um, Jesse just speaking um, earlier in the week. So maybe that we take another question, EJ, while Tom lines it up. Yeah, that's good. So you mentioned before how privileged we are in the UK uh, because you know we have been campaigning for a future, but this is happening in like it's happening right now in other parts of the world. So I'm just checking the Slido. Um, what would you say as young people we should do in terms of our messaging? Like how, how could we potentially change it to make sure that we are including um, the message of how terrible the climate crisis already is and how much it's affecting uh, young people and people in general in the global South? So I think that's a really good question. Um, like I would count myself as a climate activist, maybe not a very perfect one, but one nonetheless. And what motivates me is thinking about people like Jesse and Isaac and their communities and the injustice that they face. That is what drives me to want to see change. Um, I think that here in the UK and in other European countries, it's amazing that, you know, this movement um, of young people just suddenly occurred. It was a really one of the most positive things of the 21st century so far. But I would ask young people when they're taking action, when you're talking to your elected representatives, when you're speaking to Annalise, to Tom, to others, to also have in your mind... Um, the position of the young people in the global south and the challenges they face and in the solutions that you propose factor them in to your recommendations and what you ask for this country owes a vast debt to countries like malawi to put right those problems and that is very rarely discussed explicitly in climate campaigning and i think that's one missing jigsaw piece that we could think about So, yeah, tell us your name and also uh, what does climate crisis mean to you and what impact has it had on your family or yourself? Hi, my name is Jason Koma. Climate crisis, these are hard and danger conditions which are brought by climate change. Due to this climate change, my life is very hard because my family depends on farming. Therefore, due to climatic conditions, they fail to produce more, which leading to hunger in our family. And this also affect me on my schooling because my parents fail to pay, to pay me school fees. Has it had any impact on your community as well? Like, could you even comment? Yeah, this is also hard to my community because, as you can see, this river is dried up. This river, my community use it for irrigation, but as of now, the, there is no more irrigation because the river is dried up. How are young people, you know, getting involved as climate activists? I and my colleague Isaac, we have a club at our school which is campaigning for good climate. For example, we are trying to plant trees and have ways of disposing waste. Why is climate justice important, an important part of the global movement? 
climate justice is important because it helps the globe to be aware of climate change and the, the impact of climate change and it is also enable people to take action on it. How could the UK youth best promote and support climate justice? The UK youth, they supposed to keep on campaigning and influencing their readers to take action on climate change. For example, having countries like Malawi by giving them alternative resources like solar panels. They also try to contract with some young students from different countries so that they can also take part in acting on climate change. So how do you want young people to influence their local or national government's climate policy? What advice do you want young people to give at the climate summit, uh, the young people at the climate summit to give to the Oxford City Council? The young people, they're supposed to have policies locally which is going to act upon those people contribute climate change and they they also supposed to take part in acting uh, acting against the negative impact of climate change and my advice to young people is that they suppose they supposed to keep on campaigning for good climate condition and they also supposed to take part in contributing good climate condition for example um, influencing their country to reduce emission and uh, they're also supposed to influence them to help some countries okay um do you want to take another question and move on to the slides ej uh, well, which do you think would be most beneficial right now? I think we race through towards the end and then take a couple of questions together would be yeah, that sounds cool. Good. Okay, so that was, um, you've just heard from Jesse and Isaac. So next slide, um, the second um, young person who is going to um, speak with, to you this morning, um, Tom, the next is um, Hilda, Hilda Flavia Nakabuye. Now, um, Hilda is a university student and climate activist in Uganda. She founded the Fridays for Future Uganda movement. And you can connect with Hilda and, and the movement on Twitter. And I'm going to sort of recommend to you, if you are interested, all of you to follow the different Fridays for Future movements across the different African countries, because there is a lot of absolutely amazing campaigning and action um, going on that we very rarely hear about here in the UK. So Hilda also recorded a message um, for the summit last week and all being well, Tom will be able to line it up. Yeah, just having to wait for all of the uh, tech to get into position. It's always one of the most fun parts of, um, yeah. uh, of live streaming. Oh. Hi, I am Hilda. I'm a climate activist, founder, Fridays for Future in Uganda. My country, Uganda, is facing constant floods that are claiming people's lives and so far displaced about 200,000 people. My community is along Lake Victoria Shores, which were recently flooded due to heavy rains and partly because of the way we humans behave and treat nature around us. For example, damping. One person throws a bottle and says it's just one bottle. And before you know it, the same statement is said by a thousand more people. Therefore, a thousand bottles in our lakes and rivers. As an individual, I started a lecture cleanup activity as a practice to change people's attitudes. You too can make a decision like this because most of the choices we make daily have a climate implication. From switching off lights when you leave your room to having a long shower and tightening the water tap, Think about it and whatever choice you make, first think about the millions of young children from Africa and the global south that are suffering an injustice they do not know about because of a selfish decision. 
It's for this reason that I and other young people around the world are standing up and acting even when our leaders are paying a deaf ear. We need you to join us in this fight for climate justice. It's climate justice because the people who are least responsible for this crisis are the ones that are suffering the most. Many policies have been made, but implementation still remains a problem. We cannot go on like this because we are headed for a mass extinction and we need climate action more than ever. Our leaders are always willing to vote for something in 10 years to come because it does not really impact them. We need to advise them to make climate action a daily practice. They should stop waiting for pandemics and disasters to break out for them to act. Right now, humanity's biggest threat is the belief that real action on climate is being taken, yet nothing is being done. My words might sound inspiring to you, but what do they inspire you to do? Okay, some deep questions there. Yeah, that was, uh, I think it's been really great that we've been having the videos and being able to have young people from the global south speaking for themselves. So I was, I was just going to wrap up. Um, I put a couple of questions onto a slide, but I'm sure they're the same questions that many people are thinking about in the room. And also um, both Jesse, Isaac and Hilda all asked for feedback from this morning. So I don't know how you would gather that, but I'd very much like to reach out to them next week and just give them some um, reaction from the summit, just what people are thinking and what sort of plans people have for the future. And maybe even we can talk about how to link up if any, if um, EJ, if you and any of the others want to discuss how we might do that, uh, we can have a conversation. But over to you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that pretty much everyone else on this call would be in agreement that those videos were very powerful. And it's not just enough for us to just say those were powerful, inspiring videos. Uh, the city council and other politicians in the country need to act. They need to take the feelings that they get from watching videos like that and turn it into action. So, yeah. And, um, I, uh, since we're running over time a little bit, I think it'd be good to finish up with one question for you, um, which would be what should rich countries be doing to address uh, the climate crisis in the global south? Because it's not just about, it's not just about stopping emissions, it's about how we owe them a debt uh, because we wouldn't be where we are without them. So what should we be doing as a- um, Absolutely. So next year in Glasgow, the, the COP26 Climate Summit takes place and is going to be addressing these very questions. The sort of balance of redistribution and compensation, which should exist between the countries of the world to, to try to address the issue of climate injustice. So the fact that that conference is taking place in the UK, that all the world leaders will be here and that the UK will be leading and chairing it gives all citizens in this country an opportunity to um, campaign and to bring their voices to be heard there. And also at a more local level, when you are having those discussions with um, Annalise Dodds and her surgery, bring in the stories of the Global South and of the climate injustice into, that, in, into those meetings that you have with elected representatives. And for Oxford and other cities and municipalities, why not do a, a paired um, relationship with the community in the Global South? I know Oxford already has one in the occupied Palestinian territories and one in Nicaragua, but why not explore climate justice through those sort of municipal um, relationships that our different towns and cities have with, with other countries? Yeah, definitely. So. Thank you very much um, for everything you. uh, that you've shown today. And definitely if um, you can put us in contact uh, with those activists, I'd be very grateful. Uh, but for now, uh, we're gonna be moving into a 
five minute break, uh, just because everyone watching will have a lot to mull over uh, from what we've seen so far. So everyone will be returning at 11 o'clock where Linnet is going to be facilitating a session on transport.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the second half. We're going to kick off with a topic with the third topic session on transport, which after hearing from Hilda's message about things that we can do to reduce emissions in our own local environments, this seems like a really fitting following on because Oxford obviously has quite a lot of um, transport being an urban area and so that's one thing that we can tackle. We're going to hear from Professor Miles Allen who is the Professor of Geosciences Science in the School of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford and also the head of the Climate Dynamics Group in the Physics Department. Um, last year Miles also opened the Oxford Citizens Assembly on Climate Change and was the coordinating lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change special report, which is the IC IPCC report, which is has informed a lot of our um, decision making and activism on climate change. So it's great to hear from you, um, Miles. Do you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. Yes. Um, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm no expert on transport. In fact, uh, Nick, uh, who's who's going to be talking to you in a minute, is is uh, in fact. Your, your own members of the council uh, are probably more expert on Oxford transport systems than 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 I am. But that said, um, I I could sort of share with you some thoughts and get, maybe get a discussion going. We've got about twenty minutes for this uh, session, and this is certainly something for all of us to talk about. So I'm going to talk a bit about Oxford's own uh, travel challenges. Um, actually, using so if I if I may, I'll just share share a screen and. Uh, uh, <coughs> So this is um, a uh, presentation actually mostly uh, lifted from Tim Schwannen, who's the director of the Transport Studies Unit. Um, but it fits quite well because I myself am uh, director of a new initiative from the University Oxford Net Zero, which is working out how we're going to support as a university, um, institutions, countries, cities, getting to net zero and dealing with that difficult last 20% or so of emissions that we still haven't really got the policies in place to handle. And, you know, some of those may be related to transport. Oxford's in a relatively good place um, for dealing with transport. We've already got a lot of momentum going. Uh, there's a lot of been a lot of announcements over the past year, pledges for bus services and cycling routes. One thing which some people are quite worried about is, of course, um, COVID-19 has pushed a lot of people back into their cars and away from public transport. It's also put a big squeeze on public finances. So one thing that you know, young people are gonna to have to be keeping, keeping an eye on our politicians about um, is whether they'll start to unwind these commitments to environmentally trend friendly transport um, as, as we recover from the pandemic. One of the things that actually many people have pointed out, the pandemic provides us with an opportunity to think about the way we approach transport. And I'm gonna come back to that really in, in, in a minute to sort of give you some things to think about. Oxford's got a lot of very well thought out um, transport policies with the aims of improving connections between places near Oxford, reducing the congestion in the city center, of course, which is vital for people's health and also tackling pollution both at the local level and a global uh, and and a, 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 and global climate change, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits of this. They're all highlighted on this uh, poster here, and you all know the the benefits, and you'll have experienced them uh, going to and from school. If if you don't have congested traffic, um, it's it makes breathing easier and so on. Particularly important for young, you know, particularly very young people. If you've got little brothers and sisters you know, their, their heads are at uh, exhaust levels. So it's really, it's really important for them that we do something about our city's air. Um, Oxford is still one of the, one of the um, uh, worst polluted cities in Britain, actually, thanks to our geography and our, our sort of unique um, circumstances. So, so we're, we're working on this, but it's important to emphasize it's not just about building stuff. I, I don't know where this is. Uh, it's a picture from Tim, uh, but uh, you know, this is, uh, a well-intentioned effort, no doubt, um, to build lots of bike racks, but you'll notice they're all empty. So there's, there's, the, the city council can't do this for us by providing us with lots of bike racks and so on. It's about people changing the way they operate as well, um, which is about carrying people with you. And here's some examples of efforts over the years at carrying people with you in terms of greener, cycle, uh, greener transport options um, back in the 
probably around the Edwardian times, there's people trying to promote cycling when it was still a very unfamiliar form of transport. And then, you know, the kind of reactions you get, this was 2000 and not very long ago, actually, 2016, um, when the Daily Mail suddenly decided they were going to run a campaign saying, no, we want all our bike tracks back, so to speak, I mean, to fill them with stationary cars. Um, now, you know, you could probably can't stop the Daily Mail from suddenly getting bees in its bonnet about uh, issues that it decides are, are really important to its readers. Um, but you can kind of make it harder for them to turn these things into causes to throw sand into the wheels of trying to decarbonize our transport system. And I think we do need to think about that going forward. And one of the things that I worry about is when transport policy is based on banning things rather than encouraging people to use different things, um, that's when you tend to get these reactions. So the Daily Mail is probably not actually against cycle lanes, well, maybe they are, but, but, but they're probably not actually against cycle lanes per se. What they're really exercised about is, you know, this little picture in the corner where you've got some of the road space devoted to bikes and then the cars congested in the other half. So they actually, it's they want that space back, so to speak. It's, it's they're keeping the cars out of the cycle lane, which gets people wound up rather than cycle lanes per se. So I think we have to think about how we encourage people to take other options rather than necessarily relying on bans. One of the things I am worried about is, you know, I think it, I, I'm all in favor of electrifying transport. I can strongly recommend driving an electric car. I think it's, 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 it's a much, for me, a much pleasanter driving experience, but um, it's, if we do it through a ban, uh, we risk this kind of backlash. So I'd, I'd be interested in, in, in your thoughts on, you know, how we approach this, bans versus incentives. We've also got to think about unexpected consequences of um, apparently completely positive developments. Like, for example, you make cars more efficient. You get more miles per litre, less energy, and that reduces your fuel consumption. But then you might think, well you've got lower running costs for your car. And, you know, I can speak for myself, you know, when we got an electric car, I found myself thinking less about using it. Did we use it more? Probably not, because we don't use a car very much in Oxford anyway. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it is interesting. If you've got a very efficient car, a, a very efficient hybrid, for example, um, would you use it more just because you don't, you can afford the petrol. You 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 don't uh, you don't uh, need to worry about uh, uh, it's it's the consequences of driving it as much, and then there's the sort of indirect impacts like you're spending less on petrol, so you might decide to take a holiday in Spain. Um, and uh, I'll I'll come back to the flying issue in a minute, um, and that of course has its own environmental footprint. And then there's sort of big changes like what you know what's our uh, transport studies people like to call transformational changes, where we, we think about how we change the, the way we design our cities and so on, and the way we um, live and work. Now, if we have very efficient cars, it might encourage people to think about living in a different city to the one they work in. And that could end up actually with more pollution, more congestion. And you might end up, for example, you know, um, the example here is uh, drive through uh, takeaways, you know, you might you might drive to the McDonald's rather than walking there. So it's it's that kind of transformational change that we need to think about as well. The other thing, which I, the sort of elephant in the corner, I think, in in talking about Oxford's transport situation, is we tend to talk about cycling and how we can get cars off the road and and you know all that those kind of issues, the sort of local issues. But I just like to sort of point out to you that while you were cycling to school, uh, what were your parents up to? I and mean, a lot of your parents are probably academics. And this is a, a figure from a paper um, published uh, just last summer, just, just a few months ago, about um, the impact of academic conferences. One of the things that university people do is we go to conferences a lot. And uh, in a paper which Milan Clower led, um, in, which appeared in Nature in July, um, which uh, showed um, the impact of a single conference, the American Geophysical Union. So it's a, it's a conference about climate as much as anything. 
Um, he worked out that the total flights to that conference, if you just added up all the conference delegates flying uh, air miles, they added up to a round trip to the sun. Um, it's, it's phenomenal, the environmental impact of conference travel. And that's something which, you know, as an academic city, uh, as a university city, Oxford needs to be thinking about, you know, we, we pride ourselves in being part of a global academic community, but how are we going to operate that as it becomes increasingly unsustainable to run conferences like this, where, you know, literally the, the carbon footprint of the conference alone is equivalent to a medium sized city for a week. So, you know, this is something which I think we are going to all have to think about. Um, you know, when you, but, but that said, we're also going to have to think about the sort of justice implications of this. Um, my generation of academics has benefited massively from being able to fly around the world and, and uh, uh, interact with people wherever they are, interact face to face. Um, you know, we don't want to sort of pull up the drawbridge and say the next generation of academics can't do that. Um, so we're going to have to find another way of doing things because we certainly can't afford these massive carbon footprint conferences we have at the moment. It is worth saying this phenomenon, the sort of very high carbon footprint conference is relatively new. We, you know, we didn't do this. And, and, and also the, the, the sort of classic city break to um, you know, somewhere in to Prague or somewhere. Um, again, that's a relatively new phenomenon. We, we, we managed without it for many, many decades. And so we can probably manage without it again. Um, so, so just to sort of sum up, I mean, so the way to go about um, the, the way that Tim Schwannen would certainly uh, want us to go about thinking about transport is not to think we can decide now, this is how we're going to do it. And that's how we're going to, you know, that's how we're going to go. We have to evaluate what we're doing as we're going along and look very carefully at these unintended consequences of transport initiatives in, you know, in particular, you know, people, you know, the idea that, you know, people get more efficient cars, so they just use them more, or they spend the money on other things which actually have even bigger environmental impacts. And the one thing which I think we all need to think about in Oxford, and if you to talk to your parents about and so on, is the environmental impact of a global university just by being global. Um, and I, I think we all need to think about how we're gonna manage that and how we're gonna navigate that going forward. One thing which many people like to talk about is offsetting as a way of approaching air travel. I'd be very happy to talk about that in questions if anybody's raised it. Um, so I'll just put up this uh, nice picture of, uh, of Oxford streets um, uh, to, to prompt you to, to ask if you, hopefully we've got a few questions coming in to discuss. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, great. Shall I take away, should we take Hostel. away some, some of these questions? And yeah, start absolutely. The discussion? Yeah. So um, some people are asking about how best to lobby to reduce the cost of public transport so that we can, I, I guess, sort of that more encouragement side as you were talking about, rather than, um, you know, just banning things. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts on how best to do well, that sort of encouragement side? Both of our MPs, uh, Leila Moran and Annalisa Dodds, are pretty progressive on public transport and subsidising public transport and so on and supporting local authorities who tend to be. Uh, um, so I'm sure you could and I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. Um, and uh, so you, you can email both of your MPs to, to push for that. And in particular, right now is a really important time because, you know, the, the, the government is looking to make big cuts in all sorts of things. Um, and I'm sure Tom Hayes would 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 want me to <laughs> encourage you to encourage your government not to make those cuts in the precisely the kind of support to uh, public transport that we need to to get people back or out of their cars again after the COVID-19 crisis. Just on the sort of um, thought of what we can do in our in our city centre, several people have asked things about you know Westgate and whether you know if it's cheaper to park at Westgate than take the bus, how could we encourage that? And also talking about the low emission zone, which um, has been proposed but delayed over the pandemic. Um, and this zero emission zone is um, saying that zero emission cars can go in for free but any other cars can go in from paying. So it's not entirely zero emission. Do you think that goes far enough or do we need to be pushing for a sort of different route with the low emission zones? Um, I mean, this is really one for Tom, I think, but um, I mean, my personal view is that that doesn't go far enough. I'm just speaking personally here. Um, I thought, um, you know, the, the, the city centre 
Um, I, I, we are where we are with the Westgate. We, you know, we're not going to, we can't pick up the Westgate and put it somewhere else, you know. So, um, so but I think uh, working out how to channel traffic to the Westgate so it doesn't sort of sit uh, idling um, as as we approach and, and leave, I think is is something important that I know it's something that the council is is working on, um, and um, in in you know I I certainly feel that uh, you know zero emission uh, zones yeah you know, they do that, that's one ban that does work because it's not a complete ban in the sense that if you don't have a zero emission car you can do something else you can park and ride you can you can um, or you know the, the sort of you have other options available yeah um but uh we can take the bus but um uh but 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 uh, that what what worry me, what worries me is the possible backlash you might get from blanket bans like a blanket ban on yeah. on uh on internal combustion engines i mean i have noticed by the way it's an interesting development the, the government's sort of going on about the fact that it's banning petrol and diesel cars from 2030 but they have let hybrids stay in. And in fact, um, you know, you've got to ask yourself, is, is, a, is an early date that allows hybrids um, better or worse than a slightly later date, which is aiming for complete electrification? You know, at, at some point, yeah. we're just going to have to electrify our, our transport system. Um, and I'd be interested to hear from Nick on this, but it's in my view, the sort of uh, hybrid um, uh, compromise um, is it, it may delay may might have the negative impact of actually delaying the date of full electrification. We've had a um, sort of a few questions under the um, umbrella of the idea of taking people with you, which you mentioned. So some people have been asking um, about whether the sort of urban, you know, whether incorporating sort of things like bike racks into the urban design. Um, might make them able to be more used versus the sort versus questions about um, whether adapting when and how we work such as school start times to allow people to bus more or maybe even changing sort of bus times to suit our living we, you know how much um, can we change our sort of transport around us by our actions yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we were talking about who, who do you contact? I mean, one, um, the, the bus companies, they, they do want to serve their customers. So actually, I probably should have said, as well as writing to your MP, I, I, you know, you, you could also write to the Oxford Bus Company or get in, get in touch with them if you, if you feel that, you know, bus services could suit um, think your your life better. Um, I certainly think things like staggered school start times make a lot of sense um, to me, um, and I appreciate it. Sort of potentially makes things com more complicated for parents if they've got kids in multiple schools. Um, but um, actually, might all might also make it easier for many parents as well. And and I think you know, so those those kinds of ideas I think need we we need to be be thinking about and, and including in our modelling. One of the things that Tim. Uh, Schwannen would definitely want me to emphasize is you've got to think about transport as part of people's lifestyles rather than just as you know how they get from yeah. A to B um, you've got to you've got to step back and ask the question why do they want to go from A to B at this particular point in time um, and that comes back to the whole academic conference thing I mean you know decarbonizing conferences you know is is incredibly hard we can't you know at the moment the aviation industry has zero plans for actually going yeah. carbon neutral um, and so, you know, we really have to sort of step back a bit from that and ask, okay, so we've got this way. I mean, I'd like to emphasize this because it's something I'm doing. So I'm, it's not like I'm nagging you. You know, I, I you know, well, until this year, um, I've done a lot of going to conferences. Um, and, you know, that's somehow, we've got to somehow work out a different way of working. And I think one of the things that COVID-19 has taught us academics is just quite how much we can do yeah. this way. Yeah, I think there's quite a lot of um, lessons that we can learn about the transport and um, sort of how we can sort of move things online over the pandemic. Thanks, Miles, for that discussion. And I think bring it, it bring it there to the end towards us and how I'm um, linking it to school travel and how it does impact young people. And as we mentioned earlier, it also has benefits on our health and environment for for our, us and our families as well growing up. So it's a really important issue and really connected. Thank you for your slides as well. Great. Now you. we're ready to move on.
Thank you. To, your, to our last discussion, which is the one which is divided by the vote. And I can announce now that the one has... Oh, we have a tie. We haven't prepared. We, wow. We are not prepared for that. We've got a tie between buildings and renewable energy. Um, so we'd got, we have got lined up to talk about this. Nick Eyre, who is, um, has just been appointed the scientific advisor to Oxford City Council um, and has been involved in research as the professor of energy and climate policy at the University of Oxford and also a senior research fellow in energy at the Environmental Change Institute. So, oh, you, your one is slightly different to mine. So mine, has, mine obviously hasn't updated entirely. So we've, it has been swung to renewable energy. Nick, do you, um, how would you like to do, um, go about this? We, would you like to kick off with a discussion about the buildings and renewable energy? Or we could sort of dip in and about um, a little bit about the issues of both. Do you wanna take away with some initial thoughts? Yeah, that's, that, that's fine. I'll, um... I was sort of slightly prepared for either, but not both. But uh, let's let's have a go at both. Let's start with renewable energy because I think it's it, it, in many ways it's absolutely critical to, um, to 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 the debate about climate change. Um, uh, I mean, John spoke earlier about the role that fossil fuels and and the industrial revolution had had in essentially causing this problem, but also, of course, allowing. Uh, the sort of society that we we all live in and benefit from um, to to develop. So the question is, can we keep the latter whilst whilst losing the former? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. Uh, in the last decade, we've seen some phenomenal changes in the costs of renewable energy, so that we are now in in most countries in the world, including this one, in a position where it is becoming cheaper to generate electricity from wind and from solar power than, than in other ways. And that is a, a fundamental change. It, it's, it, it's fantastically good news. But, uh, before that, people often used to refer to renewable energy as alternative energy, as though it was really sort of only for hippies. Um, but actually, now it is mainstream energy. So it's, it's, it's a fundamental change. It doesn't mean the arguments won. There are there are powerful lobbyists for uh, for fossil fuels. We've seen the impact that they've had, for example, on the the retiring president of of, of the United States of America uh, and and the the, the damage that, that that causes. Um, in so what we're we talking about, we're talking mainly about wind, about solar, about bioenergy, about hydropower. Some of those realistically in Oxford and Oxfordshire are a bit limited. There are one or two hydropower uh, schemes on, on, on the River Thames, notably Osney and Samford. They're great. I fully, yeah, we should fully support those, but they are relatively small in scale. There's some bioenergy, as most of you may know, our food waste and our uh, biodegradable waste goes to provide bioenergy uh, in, 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 in plants north of Oxford. Again, important, useful, but relatively small. I think wind will be critical for the UK. Uh, the UK actually has the biggest offshore wind generation of any country in the world, which is quite an achievement for a small country, and we should be very proud of that. Um, Oxford is not a particularly windy county. Um, there's one relatively small wind farm Realistically, we're not going to be the wind capital of the world here. Offshore Scotland, maybe, but, but not Oxfordshire. Uh, so we're probably looking at solar, and that means two different things. It means uh, so it's so solar photo, photovoltaics generation of electricity from, from solar. We can do some of that on buildings. We, so we've seen a rapid growth in that slowed down recently because the, the government support for it has slowed and I think that should be uh, should be reversed, but still happening. Uh, but probably also big solar farms. Now, uh, before Tom tells me that's not going to be possible in the city because we haven't got a space, uh, I, I agree with that. I mean, it will, will have to happen in the, in, in the rest of the county. So it's, it mean, means co cooperation uh, uh, with, with the county council and the other, the other district councils at a local level. Um, but yeah, the, the potential is 
pretty significant if we if we can do that and if we want to make a positive contribution to renewable energy in this part of the world i think that's that that will be um the the, the next step um having said that about renewable energy it's really important to say that we're not easily going to replace all our energy with um, re with renewable energy and we, we, we are we are able to do that but actually th to the extent we can reduce our energy needs that obviously makes it much much easier and I think we should be looking uh, in in both Oxford and across the whole country to maybe halve our energy needs by 2050 2050 sounds a long way away but um, uh, that, that's the sort of timescales that, that government is looking at to, to fully de decarbonize. Um, how, what are the key areas for reducing energy use? Well, two, transport, which we've just been talking about. So, yeah, more using better low energy transport systems like cycling, walking, public transport, but also electrification of, 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 of vehicles. Uh, and then buildings. So actually, as, as Dexter said at the beginning, most of our energy, certainly in Oxford City, is used in, in buildings that drives uh, that, that energy use is what's driving um, carbon emissions. We can do a, a bit uh, through 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 behavioral change. Uh, we, can, we can wear extra layers when it's cold, like today. Um, each one degree centigrade rise in, 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 in your thermostat temperature at home increases energy use and therefore carbon emissions by, by 10%. So it's quite it's not a trivial effect. But the biggest thing we need to do is improve our buildings. Um, and that is why long, and this is an area where long time scales probably are more relevant because uh, just the scale of the challenge in insulating every building in the country i mean we, we've done it's not every building because some are, are well insulated and, and new buildings should be built that way but retrofitting old buildings and most of the buildings in oxford are obviously pretty old retrofitting those is going to be a big job it's going to take a long time it's going to take a lot of money the the role for for young people there is realistically may be a bit limited because um, most young people are either living at home or they're, or they're, they're renting and this is a job for the people who, who own buildings and it's about insulating buildings and ultimately uh, and, and yeah over the next beginning in the next decade changing the heating systems of buildings from gas boilers that emit carbon dioxide uh, to, to, to newer technologies like electric heat pumps which can can be more easily decarbonized as we decarbonize electricity so it's going to be a combination of things i think the role of young people as i say is probably not so much to do things in this area but to put pressure on people like tom um, to uh to, to say how is the city going to lead and to put pressure through your mps on government to say hey you actually need to be serious about improving buildings uh, and there's not enough resource going into that at the moment and the need to be more it's it's an infrastructure issue right we need to think about buildings as part of the critical infrastructure of the country we often don't think of them in that way we just think of them as places we we go in, in, in and out of but if we're going to decarbonize our complete economy we need to decarbonize our buildings and that means treating that means changing the way that we think about them heat them and use them so I'll, I'll leave it there because I think it's much more useful to spend time on questions and, and discussion, I think. Great, thanks. Um, just my, my first thought when you were um, discussing about buildings, and obviously we can't have so much of an impact over um, buildings that we live in, but potentially um, young people could have an influence over the sort of buildings of schools. And I just wondered if you um, had any sort of thoughts on um, where school buildings lies and where sort of in educational institution lies in sort of producing less emissions as buildings and trying to create renewable energy on site. Yeah, so I think the, 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 the latter area, creating renewable energy on site uh, by solar panels on buildings is probably the area that's been the most um, progress, largely through through the work of the, of the Low Carbon Hub, which has managed to get uh, often community funded projects to put solar panels I think most of the secondary schools in the city have now got uh, have now got so, so solar panels. 
Um, so I think that's one area we can say, you know, actually a lot of progress has been made. Uh, the quality of some uh, school buildings, I probably don't need to tell you the guys this, is still pretty low. In, in, in some cases, some of our old, older buildings are very inefficient. Uh, they have quite high heating bills. That's bad news for schools on two fronts because uh, it means the carbon footprint's high, but it also means the costs of running the school are high. And in a, an era of quite constrained school budgets, that's that's bad news for the school. So I, again, I think that, um, uh, that the county council can do a bit to address that, but their budget constrained as, as well. Uh, it is going to need a big and serious government program. So again, I think that's one for your, for your, for, for your, for your MPs. All MPs should be hearing that, that actually schools need to have lower running costs and they need to have a lower carbon footprint. Please help them do something about it. Because schools in general are not, you know, schools don't have building experts on, on their staff. This is something that's going to have to be contracted out and done, and, and, and done separately by people with building expertise. Thanks. We've got another question on Slido, um, uh, a sort of more technical one about renewable energies is, um, can nuclear energy be considered um, renewable or a good alternative to fossil fuels? Um, and I guess, you know, when talking about campaigning on a greater scale, people might want to be informed about the sort of pros and cons of that, because that is a sort of live debate. So do you have any thoughts on that from a scientific perspective? Yeah, and I should say I trained as a nuclear physicist quite a long time ago, so I, I know a little bit about this. Um, so nuclear energy is is pretty close to, to zero carbon. Nothing is absolutely zero carbon because anything you make with concrete and cement has there's some carbon emissions associated with that. Uh, so um, in that sense, it's like renewable energy. It's not renewable because it's using a, a, a fuel that, that is then depleted. So it's, it, it, it's not renewable, but it's close to zero carbon. Uh, I mean, there's some historic, there's some obvious issues associated with nuclear energy that, about the environment, particularly disposing of wastes and the, the risks of accidents. But I think the clincher now on nuclear energy is it's much more expensive than renewable energy. Ten years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. But now, why, why would you rather do something expensive that's zero carbon rather than something that's cheaper and zero carbon, given that it, we are talking about putting a, having to use a, a lot of capital expenditure to, to decarbonize the economy? We should be using the, 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 the cheaper options. That's wind and solar now, not, not nuclear. Great, thanks. Um, we've brought in a sort of um, some questions about um, COVID and how we can sort of cope with energy issues um, associated with COVID and sort of to do with schools. So, for example, in schools, we're having to leave windows open yeah. for airflow to keep COVID safe. But because of the sort of winter temperatures, that's causing a lot of we have to have heating and the heating loss. And I guess there's also sort of greater impacts of that with um, other sort of similar um, losses of energy due to sort of COVID precautions. So in this sort of time, should we be campaigning to try and find different ways to support um, schools and buildings in different ways? Or is that something we're just going to have to put aside for a while? I think that's a really good question. Um, uh, I'm inclined to say that the energy we use in the next th uh, three months, and hopefully now, thanks to the work of of my, the, my colleagues in, in medical sciences, we are looking at uh, a, a relatively short term before we can return to something like normal, um, that we should be thinking about uh, the longer term uh, use of buildings. I think COVID's thrown up a lot of interesting questions for, for buildings. Like if, if more people are gonna be working in this way, I haven't set foot in my own office in the university for, for, for eight months. What, what, do I need an office in the university? If not, what uh, what should that space be used for? Should we be thinking, uh, does this give us an opportunity to think about repurposing city centres for wholly different uses from the ones that we've traditionally used them for? So I think there's some really fundamental questions for land use planners, architects, building designers that, that, that come out of this. And I, I'd be inclined to give more attention to those than the short term, uh, than the shorter term issues. Great. 
Um, you also mentioned when you were talking about, um, I guess, us not maybe being able to influence buildings and um, sustainable energy sources being built in Oxford, but we can influence the council. And I was just wondering what you thought about um, the best way we could do that, because there obviously are sort of issues that we can tackle. So um, recently, local plans were passed that require, did not require new buildings to be zero carbon until 2030. And on some sort of measures of zero carbon, council houses aren't included in that. So there's obviously some sort of things that we can tackle, but where do we sort of start with that? Um, and should we sort of be proposing new things or helping trying to work with the council on what they've already got? So, I mean, I would, I would really echo the, 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 the point that, that Annalisa Dodds made uh, at, at the beginning, which is that, you know, councillors in general are pretty approachable. Uh, I think in the city, we're, we're, we're very lucky. I'm, I'm obviously not going to make party political points, but I, I mean, I would say that um, the decision to have me as, as, a, as a scientific advisor on, on climate change uh, was supported by all the three parties represented on the city council. So I think, yeah, don't, don't be too gloomy about the views of, of, of city councils. They are generally pretty supportive of this issue. And they're in, in many ways in the same position that we're all in, which is asking, like, OK, we know this is a problem. What actually can we practically do about it, um, particularly in a time of, 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 of constrained budget? So, yeah, don't, I would say don't treat your local councillors as, 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 as hostile. They may not all be as, as well informed as, as people like Tom are. Um, but, you know, go to them expecting and, you know, demanding that they, that, that they take action. And I think what follows from that is that all of us as, as climate activists, and I put myself down as a climate activist too, we, we need to be, th you know, uh, we need not just to be campaigning against climate change, we need to be campaigning in favour of things like more sustainable transport and more sustainable buildings that, that can, can improve our lives. I think it's really important we give this movement a sort of positive image of, of, of fighting for a better world and not just fighting against things. That's great. I think I really like how you linked that to what Annalise was talking about and making that a positive discussion and also linking it to the councillors and maybe maybe Tom in the sort of close will talk about how we can sort of build that mm. positive discussion with local councillors as well. Mm. Just as a sort of final um, sort of lot of points on the Slido people, some people have asked what um, installation can do in order to reduce the carbon footprint in terms of heating and just sort of elaborate on what you sort of meant by that because right. a lot of people might not understand um, okay. sort of benefits of that. So most of the energy and, and therefore the emissions that are, come from our buildings come from heating systems. That's not to say we shouldn't do little things like switch the lights off, but actually heating is, 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 is the big driver. Uh, and the amount of heating that we need is really determined by how well the, 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 the building is insulated. At, at, at the extreme, it is perfectly possible to build buildings that don't need a heating system at all, i.e. they're heated by the, the, the light that comes in for, through, through windows and by our own, our own body heat and that sort of thing. That's not, not realistic to retrofit buildings to, to, to that standard. But it's certainly realistic in most older buildings to halve the energy use that we need in, in heating. But that involves really quite major works that like putting uh, quite thick external wall insulation. So in insulation on the, on the outside of the building, which changes its appearance, needs scaffolding, is expensive. So we are talking about major costs here rather than, rather than the sort of thing you can, you can do, do tomorrow. Uh, and of course, it's cheaper if we all do it. I mean, I, I live in a street in East Oxford in a row of, I think it's 35 houses. It, it, to do it in this street, logically, you'd do it for that whole block all at one go. It would be much cheaper than doing it one by one. But how do we do that, given that some of those houses are privately owned? All, all, they're all privately owned. Some of them are rented. I mean, there's some real, we need the sort of legal frameworks to, to, to be able to make that happen. 
thanks thanks nick that was um, a, a good place to end it on a sort of thought for how we move forward and bring it also back to oxford and that sort of idea that we're going to have to do this as a community because us all doing yep. it individually will work but it, it's better if we do it together i think that's that's a great place to um close this discussion on buildings and renewable energy i'm gonna pass over to dexter to discuss um passing over to tom hayes and closing the session from there so I think we can all agree that we've had a truly thought provoking series of sessions today. So thank you so much to all the speakers and all the people behind the scenes who made it happen. Um, our final discussion is with Councillor Tom Hayes. Tom, um, how exactly is the City Council thinking of moving forward with all this now having had this summit? Thanks, Dexter. So the immediate response to that um, I'll give in a second, but before um, I do, can I just um, have you and EJ and Lynette think for a second or so about what your main takeaway from this whole summit has been? So I'll give my response and I'll come back to you because I really want to hear those takeaways. Um, the, the immediate response is to say that right now the City Council is developing its new zero carbon strategy. And the way in which we make that the best possible strategy is to hear from as many people, from as many many viewpoints and backgrounds as possible. So you just heard from uh, Professor Nick Eyre there, Oxford City Council's new Chief Scientific Advisor. This Youth Summit is his first public outing in that role, an independent and expert role. And Professor Eyre will be feeding into the City Council's development of our strategy. Um, we've had a citizens' assembly on climate change, the first by a UK city, which took place last year. And the recommendations from that assembly are feeding directly into the new zero carbon strategy. Um, the assembly made the recommend uh, the assembly made recommendations, and one of the responses to the recommendations by the council was to hold this youth climate summit. And this summit will be feeding its takeaways directly into that zero carbon strategy. So what we're hearing today is incredibly important. It is so significant because it makes sure that the strategy is as representative of viewpoints and backgrounds as possible. That won't be the end of the journey. Uh, the zero carbon strategy will take us only so far down the road. It will take us only so far down the road in terms of time. And clearly we're going to have to keep on learning and developing and, and adding to that strategy as circumstances change, as we have newer technologies, as we have maybe more money coming down the line from central government and the private sector. It's a constantly developing and evolving approach that we take. So I would absolutely want to make sure that the people involved in this summit, but that this kind of a forum continue to be a feed into the strategy and the work that we do going forward. Um, I'm just going to pause there and I'd love to hear from, from all three of you what you thought your takeaways were. And I wonder if I might start with Annette, because I think she may already be um, have articulated one slightly um, just a moment ago. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I think um, this has been a really positive um, discussion to be part of and I think the thing that I sort of will take away that I wasn't quite expecting was how all the different sessions seem to link and provide a picture of what we can sort of do now because we've heard from Annalise and from Tom about how we can sort of involve ourselves with the discussion at a sort of political or local council level in order to make our vo voices heard. We linked it to the bigger picture with um, with the videos provided by Oxfam or and Hilda's message, and then also brought it back to an actual issue that we could apply that to here. So I think that what I'd take away from that is that we can be empowered to be part of that discussion. And we've got a framework that we can do that. And people's voices have come through really, really clearly in the chat function and the questions have shown that we are part of this debate and that we can be and we can hold our own on that so I think that I'm I'd take away that I'm looking forward to the sort of discussion that continues on from this and how we can work together to build a sort of positive relationship to move forward in our city with the council wonderful um that was brilliant Dexter how about you so I was really impressed as it touched on by the positive spin that all our speakers put on it um there was a big focus on not shutting things down and trying to tackle the problem through banning things but offering alternative solutions and um this 
largely revolves around facilitating people's desires to change and live a more sustainable lifestyle. Um, as we can see, loads and loads of people everywhere are wanting to change, but maybe they don't necessarily have the um, ability to channel that desire for change. And so I think it's very promising that we can um, get this um, summit together and try to start com coming up with a plan for it. Brilliant. Uh, that's really great, Dexter. Um, really interesting. And EJ, how about you? Yeah, so I think that um, my sort of initial thoughts after the, the summit uh, are that there's a lot that the city council could do. Um, and there's a lot that needs to be worked on and improved. Um, but that if the city council and in fact other local councils in the area, if all of you work together, um, then we can solve these issues. Uh, it may take some time um, and we may have to prioritize certain things over other things. Uh, but we as constituents and um, councillors as our representatives can make a really big difference. And you know the issues that we care about. Uh, you know that we need better transport. You know that we care about renewables. So this just represents an opportunity um, for us to really come together and actually talk about this. So the fact that we've been able to talk kind of face-to-face, -face, obviously not properly because of COVID, um, means that I think that we've been able to have a proper discussion and that we could really improve things. Wonderful. Thanks, EJ. I think all of those reflections are, are absolutely brilliant. Um, the things which came through from my own side, if you wanted to know how I was hearing it, are, and I think Dexter touched on this in particular, which is the question of ability and power. So the City Council has a certain amount of funding provided to it, and it has a certain number of powers. And we work within an environment which is made up of that money and that power. And we do all that we can. But this summit is intended to find out two things. The first is, how can we do things even more creatively? What are the ideas that we haven't had so far? And I think we've got some really interesting ideas that have come through. And we've got some really good suggestions about how to do things differently. But then it's also about how do we influence, both as a council, but actually as citizens, how do we influence those people who've got more power and more money? to give this environmental issue the greater priority that it deserves. And I think we've learned really um, helpfully there from uh, Annalisa about the ways in which you can lobby your MP and you can try to affect national change. We've heard from two world leading scientists about the scientific necessity of making change. And I think the absolutely crucial bit of this was hearing from our youth through the, uh, through the Zoom calls, but also through the questions about what they feel the key questions are, what they want to know more about, how they want us to go further, but also saying to us, they want us to go further and faster. There's a real energy that I think is coming through in this summit. And as much as I possibly can, I want to work with young people and support you so that you can continue to provide the creativity, continue to provide the energy, and most importantly, continue to provide the accountability. The questions that came through in the chat were tough questions. You know, they were really putting the council on the spot. They were putting the MP on the spot. They were really putting our scientists on the spot. I want to find more ways as much as we possibly can as elected officials to be put on the spot because we know that addressing our climate breakdown is the right thing to do. We know that we don't necessarily have all the resources we need to, to address our climate breakdown, but by putting us on the spot, that's how you give this issue the priority that it deserves at a national level so that locally we can do more. And so I'm really grateful to all of you for the contributions that you've made. Um, and I can't wait to have a further opportunity to be hearing from young people in Oxford about how we can go further. And I would love to think that you will be in contact as a consequence of this summit with your own councillors, with your own MPs, um, perhaps with bus companies um, to say, this is what we want, take it forward and do it now. And I'll close just by saying, politics is a very human affair. We may not be face to face in person, but we are face to face on Zoom. When you stare into people's eyes, when you stare into the whites of their eyes, and you recognize their innate goodness and decency about addressing our climate breakdown, you get into the kinds of conversations about this is my life, this is my future, and I want things to be better. And so at the end of the day, politics being very human, you can make these very human decisions. So please do keep on representing your views, your values, 
your wishes, your hopes, your dreams. Um, paint that vision for politicians and bring that energy to it because that will, how, that will be how we achieve the change that we all need. Thank you very much to the facilitators. Uh, thank you very much to all the participants. And thank you to everybody at home who has watched this YouTube video. Um, please do share it with your friends and family. It's on the City Council's YouTube page. And let's make sure as many people as possible are able to see this and recognise that Oxford is an important place to address our climate breakdown. But also, as John from Oxfam was saying earlier, we're part of a bigger world. And we need to make sure that we're not worsening our climate breakdown because that just fuels further poverty, further inequality. And what we want here is a fairer and safer world. Thank you. Uh, right now, guys, I guess it's time for a fair, which is that you have power and there is a lot that you can do. So whether you decide to join uh, a youth climate activist group like Oxford Youth Strike or XR Youth Oxford, or whether or not you decide to regularly write to your MP or go banging on their door being like, you will let me into your surgery. I will talk to you right now. There is stuff that you can do just because you're young, just because you may not necessarily be able to vote. Uh, or have had the chance to vote yet, doesn't mean that you don't have power and that there aren't things that you can do. And, you know, whether you decide to go something with a bit more low-key, that's a bit more low-key, like um, getting some recycling put in at your school, everything you can do helps. So whether you've watched the summit today and feel really inspired to do something, or you've watched the summit today and thought, eh, that was pretty interesting. Uh, we're glad that you watched. And if there's any more closing remarks from any of the other young people, then let's get on with it. And if not, then feel free to enjoy the rest of your day. Just talking to people about the climate crisis and the problems that we're facing can be an incredibly powerful and effective method of getting um, people uh, of educating people and um, helping to um, get them more involved with um, tackling these issues it's something that we can all do and something that can really connect with people on a far more personal level than um, holding up banners and signs in the street. Um, and uh, even a summit like this, you can have a back and forth. So please, if nothing else, just start having those conversations with your friends and family members, um, people you meet, people at school or work. Um, and from there, um, just these small conversations, they can start leading to larger and larger changes being made. I'd like to echo what Dexter, Dexter was saying. Everyone who contributed in the chat and watched today has already done a great amount of work and all your questions were really insightful and to the point and really show that we can hold our own in these discussions and so that we should participate in them. Um, we're gonna have to make a lot of changes and change begins with empowerment. And I hope that you feel empowered by these discussions and um, talking about these important issues that affect us on this platform. And I guess that empowerment begins at a local level. So having, having this summit in Oxford with a focus on Oxford is, is really allowing that to happen at the root so that we can, we can take on that, that drive for change in our local environment and see that happening, which will influence at a greater scale. So I, I hope you have enjoyed the session today and have taken a lot from it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what we do as young people in Oxford and Oxfordshire over the next year. Thank you.